Welcome into a very special edition of the Celtics Talk podcast, where we look back on the life and legacy of Celtics legend Tommy Heinsohn. Over the next hour, Tommy's colleagues and friends share stories of his impact on their lives and the game of basketball. Hear from Danny Ainge, Paul Pierce, Doc Rivers, and many more as they reflect on the Celtics icon. Let's bring in the guy who maybe know who has known Tommy the best over the last 40 years, our own Mike Gorman, the voice of the Celtics. Mike, uh, good to see you, obviously, on this very sad day. Just uh, give me your initial thoughts on the loss of our friend. Well, you had me at hello, Kyle. <laughs> And um, I've been practicing doing this all day. I'm not sure how, how I'm going to get through it. But, uh, yeah, I, Tommy's in a better place now. It was it was a tough couple of months for him here uh, going down the stretch. And um, I, I think there's a certain sense of, of relief uh, now. And uh, hopefully he can just he'll rest in peace uh, unless they put him anywhere near officials. Then he'll have a real problem. <laughs> but, uh, he, he, um Tommy's, I say this to people all the time. I mean, he's one of a kind. Um, he's the only NBA color guy I know who brings his watercolors on the road with him and goes out and uh, sits in parks and paints uh, when he used to be on road trips. Um, a voracious reader, would, uh, was a fanatical reader about World War II and especially Winston Churchill, read every book you could ever think of on Winston Churchill. There, just, there were so many sides to Tommy um, besides the guy who thought that the Celtics were getting hosed every night they played by the officials. And then, and too many people, I think, characterized him that way. And they thought he was one dimensional. And Tommy was anything but one dimensional. He was a, a multifaceted guy. And, um, I, you know, you guys are young, so it's hard for you to say this, but uh, he's been my friend for like 45 years. That's amazing. Mike, when did you know all the different sides of Tommy Heinsohn? Obviously, when you did the first game, you must be thinking to yourself, like, oh, here's Tommy Heinsohn, the player. I've seen him as a coach. I know him as a broadcaster, but what about all the other sides? When did you find out about those things? It was kind of a gradual thing, Scal. It was, you know, it, um, on the road is where I'd find out more. You know, he used to sit right behind me where you sit on the plane now. Yeah. Uh, that, that's where Tommy used to sit. And, um, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd look, go back there, and, and all of a sudden you see he'd grab two books out of his bag, and one may be an art instruction book or uh, somebody's work, not instructions books. He was way beyond instruction books. But an artist book on, about their works and what motivated them and why they were, who they were. Um, then it'd be a book on Winston Churchill there. Then he'd have his basketball notes for the game spread out somewhere. And he, he just, he had a very thirsty mind, uh, and, and he had to get a lot of input to it. And, uh, you know, people didn't think he did homework sometimes for games. He did a lot of homework for games. He was ready when he walked in the door uh, at the garden to go do a game and talk knowledge knowledgeably about the other team. He just didn't want to talk about the other team. He wanted to talk about the Celtics. That's who he cared about. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, it was a gradual uh, thing with uh, over a period of time that I learned the many sides. I'll tell you one story, uh, and I promise not to choke up in this one, but um, when Terry and I got, got married, it was about eight, ten months later, and, and Terry said, look, I, I, I don't I'm not trying to make anything out of this. I just thought you should know we never received any kind of gift from, from Tommy and, and, and Helen. And I said, oh, it's, you know, they got a year thinking to myself, well, he's got three weeks left, and if he's going to make that deadline. Um, so anyway, we get a phone call from Helen, and she says, Tommy's doing an art show. you got to come to the art show this weekend. Um, and we had said no to a couple of other invitations to art shows, so I said, we really got to go to this one. So we go. It's up in Gloucester somewhere, and we walk in, and all of Tommy's paintings are on the wall, and in the middle, this is where I lose it, in the middle of the room was an easel with an oil painting of the inn that we got married in. Uh, and Tommy mm -hmm. had snuck out during the wedding and taken photographs of it and then taken a year to paint it. Um, and it hangs in a very prominent place in our home right now. But um, but that's the kind of things that you, stories should hear about. Tommy was a romantic at heart. Um, and uh, again, people who judged him on how he reacted to officials, <laughs> you're just seeing a tiny sliver of the pie. Yeah, Mike, you talked about all the different things that he's done, all the successes that he had. Do you, has he ever told you why he has that thirst for knowledge? Was it something when he was younger it started, as he got older? Was it, you know, him meeting Coos or Bill Russell? Why did Tommy, uh, like, sort of reach out and try to find out all this information where a lot of guys are just, like, happy that they're in their inner circle of basketball? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, Tommy, when he, was, when he was younger, had a real chip on his shoulder. 
a lot of guys who you would talk to who played against him or I would talk to and that's what it was like to play against him. They're like, whoa, you know, he didn't want to get in his way. He didn't want to get near his elbows. He would dig him into you. He was, he was just tough and he, he had something to prove, which, you know, he, he put up those remarkable numbers. Uh, oh, that's a great shot. He put up the uh, remarkable numbers in the uh, seventh game against St. Louis when the Celtics won their first championship. Uh, he went for 37 and 23. 37 points, 23 rebounds. And as he would tell you, he missed eight free throws in that game. So, um, but the Celtics won in double overtime. He was the star of the game. He was the rookie of the year that year, not Bill Russell. He was the rookie of the year. That hook shot off the glass. Like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, he, again, he had a chip on his shoulder. To go back to your question, though, Scal, he had a chip on his shoulder on the court. And then, as you know, Tommy retired from basketball when he was 30. Yeah, uh, you know, the injuries just caught up with him. So now he had to compete on another level, and he had a very sharp intellect, and, and he decided he'd compete on that level. And it, uh, you didn't want to talk about World War II unless you really came with your guns loaded uh, <laughs> because he knew all about it. He knew what Winston Churchill's plan was. He knew what this guy's plan was. Um, I, uh, the the, the uh, spy novels, he devoured those authors. Um he, again, he he decided he couldn't play ball anymore, and he was going to get you with his with his smarts. Yeah. And then came back, of course, and coached the two world championship teams. Um, there wasn't much less for him to do except, except come sit by me, which he did, which <laughs> was my big break. Yeah, it, it, speak to that, Mike, because you, you guys called games together for 39 years, and, and I remember you always telling me the story. You know. You talk about Tommy prepared for the games, but it's not like he had notes courtside. And I know as a play-by-play -play person, you come prepared. You come with all these stats and ready for the game. Tell me that story, uh, uh, the message Tommy gave you that sort of impacted your career throughout. I remember this one. It's <laughs> <That's laughs> <Yeah>. a good one. <laughs> well, we had, we had done maybe a total of four games together, or five games together for Providence College. And that's where I first got a chance to work with Tommy. And Tommy was good on those games, but he was very much the kind of the guest analyst. Um, we, we played, Providence played Holy Cross, and he was into that game. But the other games, he was, he was there, but he wasn't the real Tommy. And then came opening night against the Indiana Pacers in my first game as the Celtics uh, broadcaster. And Kyle, as you know, we all do the same thing. We've got these manila folders that we fold out, and we write down it's so much useless information we'll never need. It's multicolored. It's every, everything you want. Sometimes everything you want is there. See, so, you know, that's, that's, that's me and Tommy right there. That's, we don't even need to look at each other. Um, but anyway, so I do my notes, and I am just prepared. I am over-prepared for this game. I got every stat you could possibly think of, every story you could possibly think of. I got keywords written down in different colors and everything else. And I'm all set up, and I spread myself out on the, on the broadcast uh, table, which was in the old gondola in the old Boston Garden that hung off the first balcony. So um, Tommy's laying in there smoking a cigarette, and we're about three minutes from going on the air, and he goes, what's this blank? And he points to my notes. <laughs> And uh, I said, those are my notes. And he goes, we're not going to need that, this blank. And he takes my notes and he crumples them up in a ball and he throws them off the first balcony. Okay? <laughs> this is Kyle. You, you, know, you know what this is like, Kyle. This is, this is 10 hours of work. Okay? Right, right. Just, That's now, your some, lifeline. Some little kid is running around. Yeah, some little kid is running around down there with this. Look what I found. Look what I found. You know? It's multicolored. And Tommy looks at me and I'm in shock. I'm thinking like, wow, this is good. Because... Another part of the story was when Tommy got Tommy got the job with Prism, and I think they gave him a four or five year contract uh, with me. When I asked for a one year contract, the guy I never forget, forget it. The guy looked at me and said, "Let's just see how it goes first. <laughs> so, so, so I have I have no contract. I have no guarantee of anything. Um, and now my notes are all down there on the floor. And he's standing there with his arm around me, a cigarette burning in his hands. And he, he would call me kiddo, which I loved, you know. And he said, "Hey, kiddo." We're going to talk about what we see. That's all we need to do. Mm. Um, and that's what we did for 39 years. We would sit down and talk about what happened in front of us, as opposed to, as a lot of guys do, Paul Pierce goes to the free throw line and you hear 9,000 things about where Paul <laughs> went to college, what his likes are, what he does, what he doesn't like. Tommy was like, none of that bullshit. I don't want any of that stuff around at all. Um, and so that was great for me. So, uh, I, as you guys know, I had Dick Leip, who was the, the, the guru of stats, sitting in to give me numbers, and, and Tommy sitting yeah. on my left. I, I, I was a great position, Kyle. Really, I just lucked into that one big time. Yeah. Mike, how did you, I guess, develop that chemistry with Tommy? Because I, I remember when I first started working with him on pre and post game, I would refer, refer to him as Mr. Heinzing. You know, I had that kind of reverence 
uh, for him. How did you, I guess, develop that chemistry? And I, I feel like you guys were such a perfect pairing for each other. You know, if not the longest, the longest, one of the longest uh, tandem duos out there when it comes to calling games. How did you develop that chemistry, though? Well, I think one of the things was that that I couldn't do what Tommy did, which was analyze the game. Uh, and so I never went near that whole area. Uh, and he didn't want to do what I did, which was <laughs> give the time, give scores. So there was no conflict there in terms of one of us stepping on each other's toes. So right from the very beginning, I, I might step on his toes, but there were, there were moments like this here, which are just classic, where he's just going, run, Walter, run. <laughs> That's great stuff. That and, and um, yeah, the time, the times with him, especially at, at, towards the end, the last couple of years, um, he had he had lost some of his energy, and energy was a big part of who he who he is and who he's always been. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously, I have a, I have a hard time. That's my daughter right there. I have a hard time looking at that. No, sorry. I know. I I understand, Mike. I mean, it's. Um... Think about it. We don't know Celtics basketball without Tommy. Not at I all. mean, you just don't. Yeah. Um, I no, don't think we have. Go ahead, Mike. There's just there's there's no one to compare him to. Right. No. Um, I mean, I mean, a player, a coach, a broadcaster. How long have you been a broadcaster? About thirty years. You mean? I, I used to say sometimes when I when I'd introduce him at like a banquet or something, I'd say like if you're over sixty, you know Tommy is a player. If you're over 40, you know Tommy is a coach. If you're over 20, you know Tommy is a broadcaster. And if you're under 10, you think he's Shrek. Um, and <laughs> that, that, he loved that intro. Okay? The first time I gave it to him, he said to me afterwards, he goes, who's Shrek? What's Shrek? Right. I said, Shrek, Shrek's an ogre, but it, 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 he's a good guy. And Tommy yeah. says, he's, he's a good guy. I said, he's a good guy. He says, okay, you can use that whenever you want. That's good. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. tremendous playing career, obviously, coaching career, and broadcasting career. And one of his closest friends throughout it all was his former teammate, Bob Cousy. Our Chris Forsberg had a chance to catch up with Coos as they discussed Tommy Heinsohn. Coos, just, let's just start as we look back at the life of Tommy Heinsohn. What's the first thing that jumps to mind? What's your favorite memory of Tommy? Uh... I couldn't think of a better guy to go out and have a few beers with. <laughs> Tommy, uh, Tommy was good company. Uh, he was a man's man, and uh, he was multifaceted, as we all know, uh, uh, a Hall of Fame basketball player, uh, pretty decent coach with two championships. And then forever and ever telling New England fans about <laughs> the greatest thing in sports was the Boston Celtics. So, uh, and I, I was told uh, recently by someone that when Buster Sheary, my old coach, recruited him at Holy Cross, Tommy wasn't sure he wanted a liberal arts education. He was interested in studying medicine. So who knows? He might have gone on to be a world-renowned surgeon. But <laughs> anyway, Tommy had a lot of talents, a lot of skills, and uh, very personable. You just People liked being around Tommy. What was Tommy like as a player? I, you know, I've said uh, over the years, I, I think Tommy was perhaps the most underrated power forward that ever played in the NBA. I mean, for those fools to not nominate him when it, some years ago they chose the top 50, I think it was, mm -hmm. and left Tommy off, I mean... Uh, that was a, a total injustice in my mind. Uh, that he, Tommy had the misfortune. Well, he was a Hall of Famer, so how could you leave a guy Hall of Famer? <laughs> and, and, but he did have the misfortune of playing behind a couple of show-offs named Russell and Cousy, <laughs> who used to get all the headlines. And Tommy used to score his 38 points the way he did in the champion, first championship game. But Russ and I would get the uh, the notoriety, you know. So 
Uh, and this happened throughout his career. Tommy was a steady, solid Hall of Famer. The, at the time, the best uh, rebounding, offensive rebounding forward in the league, in my judgment. And uh, so anyway, he was... Uh, uh, I think that was his legacy. He was vastly uh, underrated as a as a basketball player. Taking the call in, Tommy, Mr. Celtic. I mean, there's no one that was been as intertwined. Is, you know, is that a fair title? Is, is there anyone who embodies the Celtics uh, title as much as as much as Tommy? No, well, I, I don't want to be repetitive, but as I said earlier, I think I said earlier, I, I have senior moments. Uh, you know, I think Tommy symbolizes more than any other Celtic that's come through uh, this thing since 1950. Symbolizes uh, uh, the uh, the Celtic dynasty better than Tommy Heinsohn. What what what, would you, what should people remember most about Tommy? Uh, well, you know, my perspective would be different than, quote, people, uh, because, as I said earlier, Tommy uh, really uh, had a wonderful personality, and uh, everyone, whether through sports or art or uh, uh, his various interests, if you came in contact with Tommy, you would enjoy the experience. Uh, Tommy was very personable, very outgoing, very bright, and and told stories probably better than any of us. So uh, I'm sure that anyone out there listening to this that, that had that experience over the years, and Tommy was never reclusive. You, uh, it was easy to get close to Tommy, uh, but that that spent any time with him would uh, look upon it as a, as a lifetime experience. Celtics head coach Brad Stevens uh, joining us as well. Brad, thanks for taking the time. Obviously, a very emotional day around here, the NBC Sports Boston Studios, and obviously with the Celtics, the loss of a legend. Just give me your thoughts on uh, Tommy Heinsohn and, and what he meant to you. Well, obviously, Tommy, incredible. Obviously, what he accomplished on the court and throughout the game has been well documented, but just the person he was um, to me, you know, he was a mentor to all of us. He was always available, um, had several phone conversations, in-person meetings, lunches over the years um, where I just love to pick his brain and hear his stories. I, I was telling um, somebody earlier today that the part that I enjoyed hearing most about was the part before I was born, you know, playing for Red and then um, coaching and and all of the stuff that he tried, um, all the stuff that he took from Red and then how it impacted him. But one of the great, one of the game's all time great winners. And I think when you've lived in um, people's living rooms the way he has, um, you know, with Mike on these broadcasts for, you know, uh, almost 40 years and and certainly before that with the national broadcasts and then before that as a coach before that as a player um, an amazing career and but just a terrific guy and a terrific mentor and uh, we will miss him yeah, Brad when uh, some of the stories I, the one thing I remember the most is him being in the media room and it felt like he had a million stories do those stories when he comes and talks to you they always have something that ties into coaching the Celtics in ways that you can improve, or sometimes he's just stopping by to tell you a story? Well, I mean, most of our conversations with coaching obviously went to running and went to play and <laughs> fast and, and, and putting people on their heels and, um, you know, just like he, when he called the game. And I think the, you know, the last time that I talked to him about uh, more of a, you know, a strategy as we entered the season was last year. I gave him a call right before the season and asked if he had ever rotated centers like we were planning on doing because I knew that he played small um, on several occasions. But, um, you know, certainly uh, we talked a little bit about the, the idea of hockey subbing centers. And to think about um, he's already 
been through that and that was you know 40 some odd years ago it's incredible but all those stories when he would sit down it was just fun to listen to i mean the greatest the greatest thrill in coaching the celtics um other than the chance to be around the players and staff and be in td garden is when those former greats come back and come through practice and i heard koozie on the phone right before i got on and um you know we've had a chance to to see a lot of them and it's been sad that a, a few of them have passed including tommy and um but what a special group and the game's greatest winners that's inarguable what do you remember most uh when you like when you first met him i mean just first of all i mean he's he was a he was a a huge personality and a huge person and so he walked in and i remember sitting down next to me and um you know i'm just i'm pinching myself scal i'm 36 years old i just left butler like and Tommy Heinsohn walks into the gym and wants to sit down and talk hoops. And I don't really have much to say because I don't know half as much as he does. So it's, um, I would just say that, you know, that was, that was what I remember from our first interaction, but, you know, um, he was such a good person and, um, you know, again, such a good mentor to so many, uh, that it, it I've see all these videos as I'm speaking that, um, you know, he was what's good about the game. Brad, did you ever get a chance, you know, over the last seven years to hear Tommy the broadcaster? I know you break down film, but is is that usually silent or do you have sound up? Do you go home and rewatch the games and, and hear Mike and Tommy? I very rarely listen with sound unless I know there's a play I want to listen to, Kyle. <laughs> and you can take you can guess which of those plays were with Tommy. Um as I've said many times, I've gotten, I get some flack because, you know, people want me to be harder on officials. I think officials <laughs> would probably tell you, I get, I get, I get my, 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 uh, point across here and there sometimes well, sometimes not well, but I always leaned on Tommy. I also had a guy <laughs> telling him everything that he thought, um, in front of the whole world. So I had a little bit of an edge there. I guess I'm going to have to pick up the slack. Um, but I always, um, I would, I would occasionally turn on um, a moment of that game when uh, I knew Tommy may be a little bit um, <laughs> edgy. Let's bring in Celtics president of basketball operations. Danny Ainge, and Danny, you've known Tommy for decades, going back to the 80s uh, as a player. Uh, thanks for coming on. Just give me your thoughts on uh, the loss of, of this great icon, Tommy Heinsohn. Well, it's obviously a very sad, very sad time right now with uh, losing Tommy last night. Um, Tommy was, I, I consider him more than a mentor. I mean, he was a, he was a great friend. Um, started back in 1981 when I signed with the Celtics. I mean, he was an encourager. Um, he, you know, he does everything he can to try to lift you up and keep you positive and um, tell you how good you are when things aren't going so great, when the rest of the world is down on you. Uh, at the same time, when, the, when you're doing great, he has a good way of coming to you to keep you humble and saying, hey, like that's the time he would do some teaching uh, I've always appreciated Tommy and his approach, uh, his love for the Celtics. It, everybody knows that. Um, but his love for each individual person um, is what's really my memory of Tommy. Uh, that and when, you know, I have a funny story. When when we were watching, when my kids were watching all the old Celtics games during COVID and we had Tommy on all the national broadcasts, it's the same Tommy. Like he's do, yelling about how we got to run, 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 and that's that's why the team is not winning because they're not playing up tempo, and it was and the referees weren't very good. So those are a few <laughs> things that we share in common, and I think Tommy has ingrained that in me. Danny, when you first got to Boston, 
Were you familiar with Tommy Heinsohn, the player, Tommy Heinsohn, the coach, Tommy Heinsohn, the broadcaster, when you, when you first got to Boston as a player? As a player, uh, I was familiar with the Tommy Heinsohn as a player. Um, I was not that as familiar with him as a coach, and I was not, even though I knew that he coached, you know, in the finals, um, 1976, when, you know, as a junior in high school, and I was very much into that, I just didn't know that much about him as a coach. Um, and I really didn't know anything about him as a broadcaster when I got there in 1981. Danny, what was it like, you know, and, and what is it like, I guess, knowing that your team broadcaster, Tommy Heinsohn, you don't have to worry about him. He's always on your side. He, he's all, you know what? I might not be able to yell at the officials you're thinking, but Tommy will take care of it for me. What's that like? What's that been like for you? Well, I mean, I, I do my share of yelling at officials right, myself, <laughs> but, um, but Tommy, having Tommy do it on the air is fun. It, I find it entertaining. Um, you know, the fact that he was such a fan uh, and such a homer for the Celtics, I thought it was endearing to Tommy. Uh, I think that we had a lot of chances to talk basketball, so I knew what he really felt after the games. Uh, you know, it wasn't always so positive about the Celtics and what we were doing right, but on the air, and, um, you know, he always gave gave that impression of just 100% support of the coaches and the players. And uh, the players all have always appreciated that from the time I was a player to, to now. Uh, players know Tommy and, and have appreciated that of, of his support. Danny, what, what's, what are some of the stories that you remember most that you were just absolutely blown away by, whether it's, you know, Tommy, when they first started, how the NBA and how they played, and the fact that he had to have a second job in selling insurance to, to you know, him as a coach. I think the funniest stories are the ones he used to tell about Red and how Red, how tight Red was when it came to reimbursing them for <laughs> cab fares and remember, train yeah, fares yeah. to get to practice, you know, like it was a $2 reimbursement. Red wouldn't do it because they were a minute late and, um, I mean, just all the stories of Red and how tight he was and how tough it was for him in negotiations, contracts. But, yeah, just getting a, an expense reimbursed was, was tough enough. Um, Tommy had so many great stories about all the players. I mean, he genuinely loved uh, Havlicek and Cowens. I mean, like he, JoJo White, like those were his guys. He loved them and loved that, loved that era of basketball. And... Um, it was fun to hear him tell all the stories of the, and he's been th there through the whole history. I mean, right. he's seen it all. He's got opinions of everybody, and and uh, that was why he was fun to, to talk to on the bus, on the plane, and uh, pick his brain when I was a player. He was he was really a very well educated guy who understood the game and understood people. And we're watching video now, Danny, of you and him chatting. And we just saw a video of you guys after the championship in 2008. What do you think that meant to Tommy, that 2008 championship? Because, uh, you know, one of the lasting images is, is his smile and how much joy he had uh, for you guys in the organization. What do you think that championship meant to him? And what did it mean to you to be able to help deliver that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, Tommy was very excited and very happy about that. But I think... Tommy was happy for me. He was happy for Doc. He was happy for Paul and KG and all the guys. Like more than he was happy for himself as a, as a lifelong Celtic. I think he was really happy for the group of people that had just won a championship that hadn't been won so long in Boston. That, that's that's the thing I, I appreciated about Tommy. He, he won enough championships, but he wanted to see the success of everybody else. Joining us right now, Dave Cowens, uh, my guy, always great to talk to the legend, Dave Cowens, uh, joining us here as we talk about Tommy Heinz. And Dave, how you doing, my man? Uh, just give me your thoughts on, uh, you know, your good friend, your former coach, Tommy Heinz. Well, you know, it's hard to be friends with your coach, <laughs> <laughs> number one. But I liked him because he played me a lot. So yeah. I had no problem with Tommy. When I got up here in 1970, um, I averaged about 40 points a game my first year. So if anybody had a problem, 
I wasn't agreeing with him because I was happy with the fact that I was getting my minutes. Scal, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Dave, um, he that's absolutely. what we live for. Is in, and I got to learn under Tommy. Um, I had a, I had great teammates. So fortunate to be able to get drafted by the Celtics, a team that knew how to win. They had a legacy of winning more than any other team in professional basketball and sports in general. So, um, uh, you know, you talked earlier about feeling um, in the footsteps of someone. Well, you know, I, I came up here and trying to say we're in the footsteps of Bill Russell. Now, how am I supposed to do that? The guy who wins 11 championships in 13 years. But Tommy Heinsohn always made you feel like you were part of all of that success that happened previously because he was sitting in the locker room before games. It wasn't X's and O's. It wasn't everybody listening to music on headphones. It was people just talking, relaxing, getting ready for the game. Um, our pregame talks were not a lot of um, X's and O's, watching a lot of film, actually no film at all. Um, and it was just talking about what you talking about, stories. Talking about the past, talking about the Celtics legacy and the history. So they made he, he made you feel like you were part of something special. And, and that helps you when you're preparing for games. You're playing, you know, now <laughs> back to back to backs and all that other nonsense. Um, but it, you know, it, it really helped and it, it it made it a very nice, relaxing um pregame situation for us to go out and get ready to rock and roll. Now, you talk about relaxing, but what was he like during the game and what was he like during the practice? Because he, he talks about how much he loves you and how hard that you mm. played. So there must have been some demanding, Tommy, you know, along the way as well, right? You know how Red used to have this deal with Russell where Russell didn't have to practice? I didn't get that. I tell you, <laughs> I got yeah, to get practice all the time. <laughs> and I wanted to practice, you know. I mean, that was part of the deal. I was just learning. And, um, and uh, you know, Tommy was prepared. Now, you got to think about the, you know, just the logistics of what was going on at the time. Tom Heinsohn and John Kittle, that was our coaching staff. We had one trainer. So there were three people other than the players that went on a road trip <laughs> with you. And it wasn't like today. And I think there were like maybe 10 people in the front office at that time that were doing everything that everybody, you know, in his front office does right now. I think it's probably a couple hundred, but there was only, a, you know, a dozen at tops. And, and so there was a real feeling of family all the time. I walked into the office before a game or, on an off day or whenever. And, you know, um, the secretaries would be there, Mary Whalen, Mary Faraday, uh, Jan Volk was there. Um, and Red was in the office. So, you know, we, we were doing it, just a few people. And um, we, we had really good teams. In the first six years, I think we grew attendance from around 7,000 to around 13,000 from 70 to 76. Now, when Bird came along, it topped it off at about 15, whatever it is. Um, so we, we, along with Tommy and the brand of basketball that he wanted us to play, which was always up and down, which fit me perfectly because I was, I was like that in high school, I was like that in college. I wanted to run. That was one of my assets. And so, um, you know, like I told you, he was playing me. And he, he created T uh, game uh, created plays for me to be able to be able to do what I did best in terms of my skill set. What stands out to you, Dave, among his accomplishments uh, that that impresses you the most? Is it as a player, or or is maybe even as a coach? Because a lot of times, great players don't necessarily make great coaches. He was really, he was really at the top, uh, top shelf of all those things that he did. Yeah. Um, he, he was um, an extraordinary person in terms of how good he was at various things in his life. He was an exceptional businessman. Um, he was an, he's an, made himself an exceptional artist. I talked to him a week or so ago, and um, I thought he started drawing, uh, uh, you know, doing his art practicing being an artist um 
when he was coaching the Celtics, but he told me he's, he took that up in grade school. Mm, and, and he said, you know, when I went to college, I couldn't spend as much time learning art because I was involved with basketball and practice and it took me away from the studio and all the things the other art studio students were doing. But, um, you know, he, he just was a, an overachiever, perhaps a very accomplished person in everything that he did. It, besides for involving himself for the good of all concern in terms of the players, he also was the first guy to, to get involved with Carden, uh, starting the coaches association to give them more bargaining power as a group. Um, so he's he's been one of those givers all the time, and you you can't probably find anybody that ever came into Tom in contact with Tommy Heinsohn and say that he snubbed me, he wasn't very nice to me, um, he ignored me. Tommy was not like that. A very social guy, and um, you know he he was he was kind and good to everybody that he came into contact with that I know of. formerly of the Boston Globe, currently with ESPN, a legend in her own right, Jackie McMullen. Jackie, we could spend hours uh, probably all telling stories about Tommy Heinsohn, but for you personally, how will you remember Tommy? So I, I was, you know, it's been difficult to see all the images of, of him today because I literally grew up with Tommy Heinsohn in this business. The first time I walked into the Boston Garden, he was there. And uh, the last time I was there, he was there. And what, what I always looked forward to was getting to the press room. And you guys know this because you've been there. You got there early. If you got there early enough, you could sit and have dinner and be quietly, listen to the great stories that Tommy told uh, of the old days. I mean, the stories of him and their team playing the Fort Wayne Pistons. And there wasn't a train stop where they would get off. So they'd have to get off and walk through a cornfield, you know, with their bags over their shoulders <laughs> or the hilarious stories he used to tell about being in a car with Red Arbeck. You know, Red Arbeck was the worst driver in history. And Tommy, you know, was thinking that his, his life was going to end at any moment every time he ever got into a car with Red Arbeck. And, and then the great stories of that 64 All-Star game where he and Elgin Baylor and Jerry West were holed up in the garden telling the owners, unless you give us a pension, unless you give us a trainer, unless you give us the rights we deserve, we're not going to play in this game tonight. It was a really pivotal moment in the history of the league. And Tommy was the president of the Players Association at, at that time. So for a young writer like me to go in there and just to sit and listen to these stories, and sometimes I'd hear them four or five times and they got a little better every time, <laughs> but I enjoyed them because it was a, an era that I didn't cover. And and Tommy it was never, you know, so many older players sometimes are bitter about what the, the, the players had today. Tommy was never one of those guys, you know that. He was so happy that the, some of the actions he and some of his, his colleagues did made the NBA that it is today a, a, a league of riches for their players. Are we talking about the Boston Celtics the way we are if there was no Tommy Heinsohn? You know what I mean? Whether it's winning the championships, whether it's bleeding green, the passion that we have for our teams. Uh, you know, I, I, I wonder about the impact on the organization Tommy's had. 100%. Yeah, Kyle, he was a folk hero. And, and, you know, my kids grew up getting to meet Tommy and getting to know Tommy, and they know him as the bombastic sportscaster that was the biggest homer that ever lived, <laughs> and they were fine with that. Now, the rest of the country didn't love it, but everybody here in Boston wrapped their arms around that. They, but my kids don't understand what an incredible player he was, guys. That very first championship they won, I remember Kuz telling me, you know, they were so desperate to win their first championship. Kuz, I remember him saying that he was – you know, throwing basketballs off the backboard. They were careening to all. And here's Tommy Heinsohn, a rookie, dropping 39 and 23 to win that championship. And here's the other thing. Bill Russell was a rookie that year. Mm -hmm. Tommy Heinsohn was the rookie of the year over Bill Russell. So he was a phenomenal player as well. And then, of course, a very, very passionate coach in the Red Auerbach School of Coaching who didn't mind mixing it up with the referees with his trademark plaid jacket. So... <laughs> This, this man literally lived every moment of an NBA career and lived it so passionate 
in support of the Celtics. I mean, I, I, I can't think of another person that was more passionate about the Boston Celtics than Tommy Heinsohn. Uh, the thing I, I, I'll leave this you with, Jackie, is it felt like whatever Tommy did, he succeeded at. And, and, you know, I don't know about how he was as an insurance salesman, but I told Scout earlier, he was probably good at that, too. Oh, I'm sure. Well, that's why he was the, that's why he was the perfect man to be the union president. Because he had a ba he had a background in pensions and insurance, he's the one that started saying to the players, "Hey, yes, we need a trainer, and yes, we need a, you know better contracts, but we need a pension." He, I think that was Tommy's idea, and uh, you know, a very accomplished artist. I had a chance to go to a couple of his shows on the North Shore throughout the years. I mean, honestly, his paintings were so beautiful when I was young, I couldn't even afford them. Mm. I mean, he's really been unbelievable at everything he's done, including, as you guys have said, a friend. I've learned more from Tommy Heinsohn than almost anybody in the game because if you wanted to know something, if you had a question, Tommy would sit all day and, and tell it to you and listen to you and help you. And, you know, as a very young uh, journalist, a very young woman, one of the only ones walking into that garden every night, I always looked for Tommy first because I know he was someone that was going to put my put his arm around me and say, how you doing, kid? And, you know, as a young, scared, not really established person, that was a pretty good feeling. Now, Max, when you remember Tommy, when you talk about him to people, how will you describe him? Uh, unique uh, in his own way. He was an amazing guy, not only as a, a coach, uh, uh, you know, broadcaster, a player. He just had the most infectious way about him. And he, you know, sometimes you meet people in life and you can just kind of, they disappear. Tommy Heinsohn wasn't one of those people. You meet him in life, you are always going to remember him. Max, what were those early years with Tommy like? Because because now we see him, you know, over the years talking to players on the side, giving advice. Just tell me about the the earlier Tommy that you know you first met uh, coming into the league. Well, the first time I met Tommy, actually, I I was a rookie and I came to uh, Red Auerbach's office. My attorney wasn't there. And the secretary ushered me in. It was Tommy and Red in the office. And all you hear was Red in that laugh, and you hear this big booming voice. And it was Tommy. And I walked in. And as soon as I walked in, it got dead silence. And I was like, well, what am I going to do now? But he was so imposing. And i tell you guys a, a very quick story about Tommy Einstein and the organization. Um, one time, Rich Gotham, uh, the president of the Celtics, called me up and said, I think he wanted me to be a little bit more on the Homer side. And I, I was thinking in my mind, I said, nobody could be that green except the Hulk. He wanted me to be like <laughs> Tommy Heinsohn, and, and there was no way I, I could be that green. So, uh, you know, I, I love the fact that Tommy, he only saw green. Uh, the Celtics were never wrong. And he took that from Johnny Moe's. And as I tried to tell people before, broadcasters have changed. You can't be the Homer like Tommy was back then or, or will always be remembered as. Why do you think even in modern times, said that, that Tommy was able to be um, that Homer and get, and get away with it, as you said, something that a lot of broadcasters can't do anymore, but his way of calling games transcended generations. It would get anybody else in this world would get you fired right now. That's what would happen. <laughs> you, you wouldn't be around that long. Um, but Tommy just had, he was an original. And he loved certain people. He loved Walter McCarty. He would pick a certain thing about a player. And I don't care how bad he was, Tommy could <laughs> find something that was really good about that player. And for me, I remember the first time he actually had me on the court. He said, you know what? You're, you're, you're not going to be like you were at UNC Charlotte. We're not waiting for you. You're going to run up and down the floor, and you're going to play defense. And there were n days after practice where it was myself, Tommy, and the basketball rim, and he had a, a shield on it where all I had to do was box out. I couldn't do anything else. He said, you're not going <laughs> to jump people in this league. So he always taught me a lesson, and, and that was valuable. What's it been like, you know, being at the Garden, you know, being a Celtics legend, having Tommy there as well and that bond you guys shared, being able to not only, you know, talk to the fans, but also the players as well and share your knowledge. 
I think sometimes Shamir reminded me of, of being like at a campfire. You know, when you went to camp sometimes and everybody would tell stories and you have one particular person who is more interested that you would sit down and you would listen to his stories. That's how Tommy Heinsohn was. He would almost hold court before a game and tell players and tell whoever it was around him about how the game was to be played, how the game was different, how it was back in the time when he played. He was just uh, he was just that unique individual, which will never cross our, our path again. Mm. Think about him as a player to win multiple championships, as a coach to win multiple championships, and to be around for almost 30, 35 years as a broadcaster. Unbelievable. Yeah, Max, you're in a unique position because you knew Tommy when you were a player and he was a broadcaster, but then you also knew him when you were a broadcaster and so was he doing the same job, but on, on, on radio. What is the greatest lesson you learned over all of those years from Tommy Heinsohn? As a broadcaster, let the game come to you. Don't try to overemphasize the game. Don't bog it down, especially my side of it as an analyst. Don't try to come in with too many stats. One of the things he do, look, he said, th those stats, you know, are, are for suckers right now. <laughs> Tell about the game. And one thing he told me is like, when you're a broadcaster, what you want to do is act like you're talking to the guy beside you and you guys are watching the game together and you have a conversation about the game. He said, that's how you get people engaged and they understand the game and they'll start to understand your style and what you're trying to give them. Pierce joining us. What's up, big fella? Thanks for coming on, man. Just uh, give me your thoughts on uh, just a, a sad day for Celtics Nation. Yeah, I mean, it truly is. You talk about an iconic figure, iconic voice, um, a guy who, you know, is there at the beginning of, you know, what we consider a tradition of, uh, of Celtic lure. Um, you know, it just... You know, he's, he's been always a guy who's been so passionate about, you know, Boston pride and um, the city of Boston and tradition. And it's just a, it's a sad day today. Uh, Tommy was a good friend of mine. Um, I really enjoyed talking to him, you know, before every game, going over there to the sideline. And, uh, you know, he's going to be truly missed. Paul, what was the uh, – do you remember your first interaction – with Tommy, you know, and by the way, I, I, I guess the rumor is he was all over it. He said the Celtics are going to draft Paul Pierce, and you were uh, projected to go in the top three, and somehow you fell to the Celtics. Um, you know, Tommy, I just remember, like, I, I remember first meeting Tommy. Uh, it was just the, and as you know, Scott, just the presence of, you know, the older Celtics, who, who've been there from the beginning, from the beginning, who started to, to tradition of Celtic uh, pride and just his aura, the aura around him, around him at first was really intimidating until you really got to know him. You know, he was a big guy, uh, had a loud voice uh, and, 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 and spoke with passion. And the one thing I will say about Tom, he always kept it honest with you. <laughs> and, and that's the one thing I really respect. He, he wouldn't be in your face telling you how good or great you are. He's gonna let you know. Um, what you need to be doing better, what you can do to improve. Uh, and that's just who he was. And uh, I enjoyed those conversations with him. Paul, did you ever go back and, and, and watch the games, you know, some of you guys' games, and did you ever get a kick out of Tommy's relationship with the officials? Or did you ever point over there and be <laughs> like, dude, this guy is on one, but he was always on your side, you know what I mean? He always had you guys' right. back. Hey, Tommy will fight for you. I'm telling you, on the air, I mean, it, it's, he, he always will fight for you. Uh, he call out the refs. He call out players. I mean, that's just like when I, when I speak. It's just that's the how passionate he was about the game. He loved it. Look, he's always seen him over there smiling and laughing. And he was he was just as passionate as the fans were. And, uh, and that's what you got to love about him. And, and, and sometimes you would think he forgot that he was on the air, <laughs> how passionate he was. Uh, when he broadcasted from the sideline. But, you know, that's who Tommy is. I mean, he's the true voice of the Boston Celtics and one that will never be forgotten.
Legions of fans grew up with him as a broadcaster as well. And so we talk basketball, you know, just talk about the Boston, the city of Boston and the passion of the fans. A lot of that comes from watching Tommy on TV. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Boston Celtics and Tommy Hansen, I mean, it's, it's, it's like all, it's like synonymous. I mean, you know, I mean, we all know that. I mean, yeah. he's a voice. Uh, if you couldn't watch, you could hear his voice. Uh, for years, for years. And uh, he's going to be truly missed, man. I mean, you, I don't know how many Tommy points I racked up over the year. I was hoping to cash in on him at some point. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that's the one thing you're always going to remember. Just everybody wanted to earn a Tommy point. Think yeah. about that. Becca joins us now as well. And Wick, you know, I, I think any of us who have worked in sports for any uh, amount of time always get asked the question, what is so-and-so really like uh, in real uh, life? When people would ask you that about Tommy, what would you tell them? I mean, I'm going to choke up. Mm. I'm going to tell you now. It's um, it's devastating. And he was, he was the Celtics to a T, all of him. He's, he was everything to us. And it was 18 years of knowing, I would see him at the games, knowing I would see him that night and knowing I'd get half an hour with him, maybe to just soak it in. It was like filling your gas tank when you sit with Tommy, because the stories about Red and Bill Russell and what they did in Russia and East Germany and in the 60s and all these crazy trips that Red would organize. And it's making me smile thinking about Tommy. I want to remember him. Uh, that way. Yeah, Wick, and, and, and the thing, you know, that, that impresses me the most about Tommy, he's unapologetic about his love for the Celtics, and rightfully so, going back to the 50s. What was it like having him as a team broadcaster and knowing he always had your back? He always thought about what's in the best in interest of the franchise. Right. It's just like having the fans of Boston, and he energized the fans as well, and so everybody was revved up when they came in. Uh, he he uh, he was the heart and soul of the team, really. I mean, it's not an overstatement. He he brought it all. And when I told the guys, you know, he's won ten rings, you know, then the younger guys on our team would be like, oh, I thought he was just a TV broadcaster. It's like, no, he's been in the <laughs> Hall of Fame twice, once as a player and once as a coach. Let that sink in. So I mean, he meant everything to us, and and he'll uh, never be forgotten. Yeah, in what ways, Wick, did he really define what it meant to be a Boston Celtic? Well, he defined it uh, for me because when I came in with my partners in 03, um, we sat with Tommy, and we sat with Tommy and Red every time we could. And what a, what, a, uh, what a gift, what a lucky circumstance to be able to work with both of them uh, before Red's passing. And, and, uh, but Tommy, Tommy had his opinions. He, he took us under his wing basically and said we're gonna i'm gonna make sure you guys know my opinions uh you know run 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 whatever it was but uh he helped advise us on hiring danny ainge um he was you know and, and on and on and on but but most of all he was just such a generous person generous with his spirit generous in every way he would if you needed something or if you you know needed to learn something from him he had all the time in the world for you you know, when you look at the organization, uh, it's a big fraternity, right? And, 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 and tell me about how close-knit of a group just being a part of the Celtics organization, whether it's Tommy Heinz or whether it's some of the greats uh, before. Like, once you wear that laundry and Tommy's been around longer than anybody else, you're part of a family. That's right, fraternity and now now sorority too yeah. with Carol Lawson and Allison Feaster and others. But I mean, um, it, it's a it's a very select group and people who selected themselves to be Celtics in a sense, and and to live up to as he would say they they pick you and then you've got to live up to it. And so if you're able uh, to live up to it and be that kind of a person on and off the court, you know it lasts a lifetime in that bond. We brought back the '57 championship team. I remember uh, years ago, uh, I guess in 2007, and it was epic to see them all together and have every 
man step up to the microphone and compliment all of his teammates. I mean, it's just the, the world could learn something from those teams. Right now by former Celtics head coach Doc Rivers, current Philadelphia 76ers coach. Doc, thanks for coming on. Obviously an emotional day uh, here for all of us, really, uh, you know, with any connections to Tommy Heinz. And just uh, give me your thoughts on the passing of this legend. Oh, man, listen, it, this one, these hurt, you know, when this happens, and, and especially Tommy. Um, he was so gracious to me. Um, you know, people... You know, people tend to remember all our good times in Boston, you know, when we won the title in 2008 and, and the whole Garnett and Pierce and, and Ray Allen and Rondo. They forget my first four or five years when, when Danny and I were trying to rebuild and struggle. And, and Tommy, over everybody else, was just a voice of reason for me, a voice of calm. Uh, I don't know how many times uh, we had conversations sitting in the car after a game uh, we would land in Boston at two in the morning and, and Tommy would, would you know, I would always give Tommy a ride uh, from my car to his car uh, just so he can, you know, stay warm, didn't have to drive. And I don't know how many times we had conversations about basketball and patience. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I tell people that uh, even before this passing, without Tommy, I really don't know where I would have been. Uh, I mean, he means the world to me. And uh, I don't think there's anybody who, uh, you know, symbolizes what being a Celtic is more than Tommy Heinz. I mean, he is, he was the best man. Uh, and he meant it and he believed it. Uh, he bled green. It was in his heart. You know, it's funny when I took the Sixers job, the first thing I said, they said, was anybody from Boston upset at you? I said, yeah, one person, Tommy Heinz. <laughs> he hated Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, so I just loved the man. He was just such a good man. Um, man, did he love a life, though. He really yeah. did. Yeah, I mean, player, coach, broadcaster, painter, insurance salesman. He did it all and succeeded pretty much at everything, Doc. You know, you, you talked about when you came here in, in those early years uh, with Tommy Heinsohn, you know, and, and here's the thing, Doc. I, I feel like when you talk about the Celtics, I don't know if we – revere the Boston Celtics culture and history as much if it weren't for Tommy Heinsohn. Whether it's the organization, through the players, and even the fans, I feel like, you know, uh, gravitated towards Tommy and took a little bit of him uh, inside of them. No, you know, it's funny. He, he's known from people outside of Boston as this great homer, right? Uh, <laughs> and he was, uh, because he believed it. Uh, but I don't know if I could have sold the Celtic culture without having Tommy around on the back of you, you were on our planes on those airplane rides. And, and uh, you hear Kevin and all those guys starting to talk about the legends. Uh, well, they could piece it together because Tommy was on those flights and he would tell you how great Larry was and how great Coos was and, and Bill Russell and Casey Jones. I mean, that was all Tommy Heinsohn uh, putting it together. I'll tell you a great story. Uh, the one that I'll always remember about Tommy, at least involving me, uh, during that 18-game losing streak mm. uh, that we had, there were these two fans that sat behind our bench, and they were just killing the players every play, every all night long, and I finally had enough of it. And, you know, it was probably the fourth quarter, and I turned around, and I was about to say something to him, and that was when the broadcast team was sitting right next to our bench right Tommy jumps up and holds his hands out to me like doc stop stop <laughs> and it stopped me I don't know what I was going to say uh but he just says stop and I did and then he came in after the game and he says I know it's frustrating but I'm telling you uh that you are a terrific coach and it's going to work out for you just be patient it's going to happen. Don't get frustrated. Uh, don't get down with the booing. Just hang in there. I'm telling you it's going to happen for you. And he kept saying, I know what a good coach looks like. And I really believe what, you know, if he's not there, what would have happened? Like mm, yep. if I'd said something and, you know, 
it's just, that was Tommy. And, and um, I'll always forget that and thank him. I'll never forget that. And I'll always thank him for that. Did you ever think about stopping him from yelling at referees or officials or anything? But did you like that fiery <laughs> side of Tommy? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. You know, it's funny. Before I took the Celtic job, I used to watch Celtic games because Tommy, for me, was so entertaining because I didn't care what the play was. It was should have gone towards the Celtics. Uh, <laughs> what was interesting is once I took the job and we would do that preseason where you met all the coaches and the referees came together. Uh, I tell you, every single time, I would have at least one official come up to me and said, Doc, can you just talk to Tommy <laughs> and tell him to please just, just, just lighten up a little bit? And I would always look the ref in the eye and say, absolutely not. Tommy is Tommy, and we love him for that. Thanks for joining us on this very special episode of the Celtics Talk podcast, honoring the great Tommy Heinsohn. Said it earlier this week during the episode where we featured Mike and Tommy, but uh, to me, Tommy was just such a legend, such the embodiment of the Celtics. You know, he was quintessential Mr. Celtics. And I remember sitting there in my living room as a little kid and my dad raving about Mike and Tommy. You know, fast forward all these years, and I remember my first night at NBC Sports Boston sitting down, and there's Tommy Heinsohn seated next to me, and I'm spitting all these analytical numbers, and I'm thinking, oh, he hates me. He, he doesn't know who I am, what I'm doing. But by the end of the night, he was walking out. He gave me like a high five or a pat on the back or something. Whatever it was, I desperately needed it. And Tommy was never more supportive uh, along the way. And uh, it, it, just an incredible man who had done so much but always made you feel a little bit a part uh, of the Celtics culture. And uh, he, he was just amazing to watch. We, we, had, we were fortunate enough last year, too, to during Summer League, we did this, this broadcast. And I always said, man, you know, all, if I could ever just call a game, with Mike and Tommy. And now wasn't wasn't a regular season game, but sitting there and four of us in the studio watching Summer League and joking and having fun, just uh just an amazing experience and so uh, j- uh someone who will be very very missed and the Celtics game experience will never be quite the same. Thank you again for checking out this week's episode of the Celtics Talk podcast. Mm-hmm.